<laughs> when you first saw the, the, the film depiction, did it seem as if, given the parameters of Hollywood and how they have to condense and make a narrative, that they captured what was happening that day? The As, absolutely. They got it exactly right. I, I, was, I was just astonished. I, in fact, I thought that they had found some old film footage, <laughs> or actual <laughs> CBS footage or whatever. But no, those were all volunteers. And they, they did it from scratch. But that was exactly the way it was. It, it was a brutal scene. I, I think <clears throat> I think what we saw there that day was, well, of course, it was an expression of hatred. But before that, it, it was fear. It was it was the, the white supremacists saw their way of life as being on the verge of being upended, and they could not bear the thought. Could not bear it. They were they were terrified. And it's easy to understand. Keep in mind, some. Dallas County, South Alabama. Uh, even then, had, had a large African American population. I can't remember the figures. Uh, but all over uh, South Alabama, there were black majority counties everywhere. Uh, and the white folks in those who were the minority, they, they were they were terrified. They were afraid that uh, the black majority was finally going to get enough and rise up against them. And, and never mind that the black majority was there because you know, they, didn't, they didn't choose to be there. Uh, it's about 100 percent of those black folks were descendants of uh, people who, well, there, there might have been a few who uh, descendants of some guy who jumped on the boat in Africa at the last minute and said, wait for me. <laughs> 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 Not their business being there. They had, and suddenly they uh, they uh, they are uh, in a majority, and the, not the white people, understandably, were afraid that the black folks were going to take over. Well, guess what has happened? The black folks have taken over <laughs> in, uh, in South Alabama, and right across Mississippi, and, and uh, Louisiana, and things have turned out okay. I, I was in some about two weeks ago with our grandson Benson. Some of you know Benson. He was at the university. Uh, he was in one of Hoyt's classes, one of Gerald's classes, and he wanted to go see Selma. So he and I drove down there. And I was astonished at what has happened in Selma, Alabama. First of all, it's a, it's a very tidy little place, still about 20 odd thousand people. Uh, it's a sleepy little southern town, clean. Uh, and I learned the figures while I was there, and I forget now, but not only Dallas County, so but all of those South Alabama counties are now governed by African Americans. They hold every job of any consequence, county government, uh, city government. And guess what? The world has not come to an end. Folks get along. After all that tumult of violence and bloodshed, it, it has worked out pretty well. How long had you been on that beat when something <coughs> at the bridge happened? <coughs> Just a couple of months. Wow. Yeah, I, I went to work January 1st, 65, in New York. And I was supposed to stay two months, <coughs> and things were heating up so fast and so on, they, they cut it short. And, uh, <coughs> Norma and I had not really got moved in in the Atlanta Bureau. You know, we were just sort of kind of feeling our way. Uh, but I had to leave immediately. I couldn't even stay and help my back, as Norma recalls it. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was spending all my time myself. But, yeah, and then, uh, but the, 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 for about 30 days, the stories were fairly routine. You know, there was a march. Uh, and people would go down to the courthouse and attempt to register to vote, they'd be turned away. But no real violence. Indignity, as, as this film shows in another part, the indignity of trying to 
satisfy a, uh, a test to be able to register to vote, a ridiculous test. Like a literacy? Literacy yeah. test, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you recite those preamble of the Constitution. Some of you have seen the movie. You remember that scene? Yeah. And that wasn't good enough when, uh, when uh, Mrs. Cooper, uh, she, and then the guy says, all right, recite the whole uh, Constitution. <laughs> well, uh, not even Mort Gill can do it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just fairly quiet until <coughs> until the murder of Jimmy Lee Jackson. And that's the the movie got it wrong, and so have any number of other places. He was not killed in Selma, Alabama. He was killed up the road 30 miles in a town called Marion, which until then was made, was known if anything, for anything, it is known as the third place in the, in the hometown of Coretta Scott King, Margaret King's wife. And overnight, it became known as the hometown of Jimmy B. Jackson, a state trooper. Shot him to death one night at a cafe <coughs> at the end of a demonstration. Shot him to death for no good reason. He was, uh, he was there with his grandfather and his mother. And the police came storming in to this cafe where they'd taken refuge beating up people right and left, and Jimmy Lee, who was only about 26 years old, went to protect his mother. He didn't try to interfere with the officer. He didn't try to take his gun, nothing like that. He was hovering over his mother, and the trooper shot him to death. And this led directly to the march of Montgomery that eventually changed America. And it, 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 it most immediately, it, uh, it was what prompted the, the, the march to Montgomery that we saw the scene of in there on Bloody Sunday. That was the first attempted march. There was a second where they turned around and went back, and then the third under federal protection, which went all the way to Montgomery. I, I, I have a few, a few problems with uh, the movie that are no fault of the movie makers. They were not allowed to use the words of Martin Luther King, <coughs> copyright protection. <laughs> yeah. His family, King's family, owns his words. Yeah. Um, and to get permission to use his words, you have to go through a whole rig of your own pace and money. And, and I think it's un unforgivable, but they forgot to ask me before they. <laughs> <laughs> I will read you. Martin Luther King's actual words. He preached Jimmy Lee Jackson's funeral uh, just a, a few days before the march began. The uh, people who did, who made the movie, what was her name, the director? But anyway, she did a really good job trying to get the tone of his words without using his actual words. She did a good job. But they were not his words, and nobody could speak or use the English language the way Martin. I want to read you a few paragraphs of what he actually said. I was there. We didn't have tape recorders in those days, or at least not tape recorders that could be carried around from portable. So six or eight of us reporters got our heads together immediately after this eulogy by Dr. King and compared notes, but we knew that we had been hearing history in the making there, and we wanted to be, try to get it as close as we could to his actual words. And this, this is the way we recorded what he had to say, talking about Jimmy Lee. He was murdered by the indifference of every white minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of his stained glass windows. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governor's on down, who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. He was murdered by the timidity of the federal government that is willing to spend millions of dollars a day to defend freedom in Vietnam, but cannot protect the rights of its citizens at home. He was murdered by the brutality of every sheriff who practices lawlessness in the name of the law. And he was murdered by the cowardice 
of every Negro who passively accepts the evils of segregation and stands on the sidelines in the struggle for justice. That might have been the best speech I ever heard him make. I, I can still hear his voice, and I'm sure there are people in, in this room that can hear that, that uh, very uh, unique, very unique. Kyle, didn't you catch that? You don't say very unique. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was, a, it was a speech of the ages. And I'm glad I was there. You were about 34 years old at this time, an outsider. I'm sure that people in, in some of the other towns in Alabama knew you didn't live there. What was your relationship with the locals? And, and did you, in those two months before the Pettus Bridge incident, had you established relationships with any of the, the leaders in the civil rights movement? The civil rights people, oh sure, they were very open and helpful. Jim Bevel, the guy with the uh, the uh, skull cap, uh, Jose Williams, the other, John Lewis, the two guys who got beaten at the bridge, Lewis, uh, he, he, uh, what a hero. Uh, you all heard him speak, by the way, he has a little speech of that, and he had it then, and he still has it today, and I, I kind of love him for it. I mean, this, here's a guy who, uh, by any standards of the public uh, figure, ought to have been held back, but nothing was going to hold John Lewis back, including having his skull cracked that day in, in Selma. At Billy Club, mm -hmm. cracked his skull. He had to go to the emergency room and then went back to Brown's Chapel to, to uh, help calm people down and, and, uh, and, 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 and then plan that march to go a long so establishing relationships with people like that was no problem. They understood that uh, we were there to tell their story. The white people were a different, uh, different matter. Can you imagine me establishing a working relationship with Sheriff Jim Clark? He was a guy on the horse with a horse whip, uh, meeting his, uh, or with uh, Major Cloud, the state of uh, No, it was. I counted the other day in some other connection. In fact, I was trying to remember this was the benefit of the grandson of Benson when we got to Selma. I remember that I could count exactly four white people in Selma who were friendly to the outside press. A couple who had come down from the north to run a, a factory. And they made it their business to befriend me and the other outside uh, members of the press. They'd have us some dinner the editor of the local paper, who was a really good guy, and the Episcopal priest. Yeah. I'm still partial to the Episcopal paper. <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, no, there was, there was no, I had nobody I could count on. Uh, if, if, if I'd been in trouble, if I'd been chased down by a mob, and that happened to more than one white person in some, right? Uh, I would have sought safety in the black community. Uh, this black couple, I mean this white couple, I mentioned, they lived up on a hill way out of town. I couldn't have made it there. <laughs> but no, that was the situation. So if it, it was a case of flying by the seat of your pants. Were people there aware of what you were writing? <coughs> not, not necessarily just that you were writing, but would they see the New York Times stories? Yes. Not many. I mean, I doubt if there was a single subscriber. <laughs> but they had, they had the, the outliers who, who would keep them informed. This is what, this is what that damn newspaper said today. <laughs> this phone, somebody himself, it would be passed around. And so there were no friendly faces. They all knew. And if they didn't know exactly what I'd been, they knew instinctively that they were not going to like it. And I was not the only one. I, I, was, I was the only reporter represented in this movie. Uh, but there were several dozen of us there at one point. And they couldn't afford to have one. Uh, the Los Angeles Times uh, uh, had a guy there, uh, Jack Nelson. He 
he was in town one time. Anybody remember yes. him? Yeah. And, and a bunch of others. Uh, and we in the, in the, in the press tended to huddle together, <laughs> not just for safety, but for kind of comfort. One of the things that I admit all these years later in, in my memoir, I was just reading from, <clears throat> is a place where all of us reporters gathered for dinner every night after we filed our stories. And this is a, this is a shameful confession, but it's time to come clean. <laughs> uh, Tommy Hole was the name of this club. It was on the edge of town. And it was a private club, which meant that they did not have to admit black folks, or God knows any other folks they didn't like. It was a private club. There are a lot of people here old enough to remember but we had several laws in Arkansas. You couldn't serve a drink openly in the town of Fayetteville, for example, unless you were a private club, the country club, you know, you could get a drink there. And there were two or three other private clubs, and that was, that was the system. We all understood that. Well, the Tally Hole Club was the only place in Fayetteville, uh, only place in Selma, where you could get a drink at the end of the day. So that's where we went. <laughs> and we paid our $5 a year membership or something like that. <laughs> uh, and we, uh, we became members of this whites only uh, Tally Hole Club. Uh, I'm embarrassed about it, but there you have it. I did it. <laughs> I, I was, I, I, when I had Vincent down there, I took him to visit the Tally Hole Club and took some pictures. It's still there? It's still there. <laughs> they, they cleaned up their act. It's now open to the public. They have black members. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was ahead of my time. <laughs> but the, uh, the it, we, uh, we had, uh, I think I remember this correctly. Uh, I think the first time I ever drank a martini was in the Tally Hole Club. And I'm, I'm a faithful adherent to this day. <laughs> <laughs> there should be something on the menu, the Roy Reed. They should come up with a drink of martini. <laughs> the, the scene depicted in the film that we watched shows you Somewhere on the periphery. Do you remember where you were standing in relation? Exactly, yeah. On the shoulder of the highway, on the Montgomery side of the Venice Bridge, <laughs> waiting for them to come down. <coughs> and the, the authorities have kind of cordoned us off, not by force, but just going to stand over here. And that was, that was customary. They weren't they were picking on us. And that was an old savage rule. We have a large number of press people. We were on the shoulder, about uh, oh, maybe 30 yards from from the front ranks of the state troopers, and we were there when they moved forward, and they were there. We were there when they threw the tear gas bombs, and we we got tear gas along with the marchers. Not nearly as much as I did, but enough. It takes a very little tear gas to go a long way. Have any of you ever breathed tear gas? I'd like to hear your story. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually in D.C. when Martin Luther King got killed. When he got killed? Yeah. Oh my God, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. But do you remember the sensation of trying to breathe? Yeah, I mean, it was intense. But... Oh yeah. Your eyes, you can't see. You can't breathe. And if you can't breathe, you feel like you're going to die, but you can't breathe. So anyway, we got enough, but the marchers got full run. I mean, it was it was awful to watch. So, at this time, because you, as you mentioned, you don't have a tape recorder, you don't have a movie camera, so you're taking notes. Yeah. yeah. This may be a silly question, but how are you taking notes and watching at the same time? That seems <laughs> like because you're seeing history unravel quickly in front of you. It's, it's uh, I never did get any good at it. <laughs> You're so tense that you can't, you can't after you can't read your own notes. <laughs> but you get a word here and there. Luckily, the story did not depend on direct quotes. The story told itself. I, I, had, I had to do very little work as, as recollecting. It, it literally told itself. It was so brutal. 
easy, but uh, yeah, I was taking notes. And I guess I ought to see if I can find that notebook sometime. Yeah. <laughs> you had to dictate the story, correct? Yeah. You, you didn't file it. I mean, you had to go to. It shows you at a phone booth in the movie. Did you do it from a phone booth or did you go back? Because I know you did some at the Albert Hotel. Yeah, this is one of the minor flaws in the movie. They couldn't get everything. You know, they, mm -hmm. and for dramatic purposes, they had me dictating from a phone booth there at the scene. Well, I, I, I didn't do that. <coughs> First of all, I followed the marching back across the bridge to the church and then did some follow up interviews and then made my way back to the Albert Hotel where all of us reporters were staying. And had plenty of time before my deadline to, to write the story and call it into New York in the comfort of my hotel. And the full knowledge that somebody was over here you know, listening to my call. Because, well, that's just what you had to expect. You mean tap? Yeah. Oh? Yeah. Or, or what you're, that was one way they knew what, you, what I was writing every day. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, they, they needed to keep abreast of the events just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we assumed they were passing it on to the police and that kind of thing. Incidentally, the police itself were friendly. And this movie, I think I remember this right, along with just about every other source I consulted, got it wrong about the Southern police. And you're talking the city police. The city police, yeah. The villains, at day after day, were the county big police, the sheriff and his deputies. And on bloody Sunday, the state police, but they weren't there day after day. You know, they were just there that one day. Uh, Jim, uh, Sheriff Jim Clark and his deputies, they were, they were the bad guys in this story. The uh, Commissioner of Public Safety, his name was, Baker, his name was, uh, was a good guy. And he went out of his way to protect the black marchers and do what he could to befriend them. I saw him one night after all this. And there was some of the kids decided they wanted to have a fight march. And he stopped them before they got into the downtown summer and talked them out of it. He said, no, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get down there, and those sheriff's deputies are going to come and get you, and they're going to beat you black and blue. At the very least, you're going to be hurt, and some of you may be killed. And he talked them out of it and sent them back home. Uh, and and he, he was that kind of a guy. He, he would try to intervene with the sheriff. He and the sheriff were enemies. It did no good. And it did me a lot of satisfaction later on to learn that, that he and the sheriff had run against each other for the job of sheriff. And he had defeated the sheriff and he threw him out of office. That's the side I got. What were you asking? <laughs> Wondering about the, the dictation you did that at the Albert Hotel. Would you type it up, write it out? I mean, type it up if I had time or just. Usually there was not time. We had a very early first edition. It was, I think, 6.30 Eastern time, 5.30 Central time. So you didn't have time to do a lot of polishing and rewriting like we like to do. Right. Uh, you have to do a lot of it to see your past, occasionally dictating from your notes from a phone booth. But on this particular occasion, I had time to at least write a lead. And I would call to a number at the Times in New York where they had, at that time, three, maybe four men uh, on duty, taking calls from all over the world. The Times had bureaus all over the world and all over this country. And they would, they would find out who was calling and, and attach me to a, a recording machine up there. And then every two or three, four minutes, they would interrupt and just to be sure that, it, that they were hearing everything right. And they'd ask me to spell a certain, a certain name. And picture this, these guys were all native New York City. <laughs> I'm a native of Arkansas. I, I was easy compared to some of those dudes from the South. Uh, there's, a, there's a line in my fair lady, here I am. Yorkshiremen converse or worse here in Cornishmen. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, and they got the new accents like that. So I was, but even, even I gave them trouble. And, 
you'd have to interrupt now and then and say, what was that word there? <laughs> that, was, that was the scheme. They would type it up in takes, that is, short pieces of paper, three or four paragraphs, folks, and, sit, and ship it out to the newsroom, and it would immediately go into the editing process. That's the way it was done before we had, uh, well, what do they use now? Your phone, tablets, there were the times, I mean, you could do this story from the outlet hotel, but there were the times you'd be on the road or away from a hotel, I would imagine, that you'd have to find a phone and maybe not know where you were going to find it to report. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it happened quite often. I remember an evening in Selma, a Saturday afternoon, and I, on, at most big daily papers, there's an early first edition because the Sunday paper has to go to bed. When would it be, Tom? How, how early would we have to? Typically, you'd have to get your stories in two or three hours before the usual deadline because the Sunday papers, you know, everything's got to be in early. And on this Saturday afternoon in the summer, a bunch of kids, including little kids, marched down to the courthouse uh, because they decided that if the grown-ups could do it, they could do it. And they marched right up to the courthouse steps, and there was Sheriff Clark. Uh, I guess he had been alerted that these kids were coming. <clears throat> and uh, he said, uh, you kids want to march? And they said, you know, yes, we do. And he said, all right, well, I'm going to let you march. Y'all follow me. And he put a, he, he put, I guess he was in the lead car, and he put a deputy behind him. And there were maybe three or four dozen of these kids, ranging from, I think, grade school age up to high school. And he marched them out of, out of town out past the city limits at a pretty brisk pace. When they got out on the open road, he stepped it up just a little bit so they had to run to keep up. And after no more than a mile, maybe less, they simply couldn't go anymore. The kids started calling out in, on, in people's yards and vomiting and, and crying. And so the sheriff then, you know, turned around and went back. And, and the last thing I saw when they pulled out was that he and, and his deputy were laughing. Now that's the kind of people we were dealing with. <clears throat> it was just about more than, than, than a, a normal <laughs> thing to stand. But you got to think, you got to remember, they, they were doing what they saw as the Lord's work. I mean, they, they were protecting their way of life. And it took brutality, but it, 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 that's the way it had to be. I, I do believe they were not, I mean, they were mean. I mean, Clark they had a mean streak. He, he liked doing this. But the average white resistor, normal human being, you know, uh, maybe a deacon of the church, at the Boy Scouts, you know, decent, or decent, ordinary human being. Uh, they truly believed that they had to do this to keep the black majority from taking over because that would upend the whole society. And it was not just a matter of power, it was that certainly. But it was it was the way God intended 